people are going to pop in at their own leisure. So um, just as a reminder, these are recorded. And so our undergraduate, alumni brothers, anybody can go back and watch them at a later time on the ZBT YouTube channel. So of course, if you have to stop out or have undergraduate or alumni brothers who you'd like to see this program, direct them there. And um, they typically take about a week to get up as we have to edit them and those kinds of things. But I want to just start today out with welcoming you all and thank you for being here. We always appreciate when people take time out of their days to be here with us. Um, and we think this is a really important topic today to talk about virtual programming as we kind of enter this uh, kind of fall term uh, in the almost completely virtual space in some of our campuses. And if you've been watching the news, more and more campuses are going virtual every day. So I uh, want to do a big thank you to the ZBT Foundation who makes our programs uh, through uh, ZBT from home possible. And so thank you to the foundation and want to just kind of start today with some expectation setting. As some of you know, I do the conduct for the fraternity, so expectations are super important to me. So first, I just ask that you be present with us this evening, actively listen, participate, and participation, participation can mean a lot of different things. If it's most comfortable, comfortable for you to unmute yourself and ask a question or do the raise your hand feature or drop something in the chat to everyone, or directly to me, all of those things work. But ask that you participate and ask questions and share your good ideas. If there are things that you're like, hey, on my campus or with this community, you know, we do this thing, we'd love to hear it. And then I always tell folks, don't say this won't work until we talk more about it. Think about how we can modify this content to work for you all. And so one of the things that I wanna start with um, is thinking about the challenges, concerns, and worries. Would love to hear some of the challenges, concerns, and worries that you all have as we go into this fall term, whether you're an undergraduate brother or you're an advisor. I'd love to hear the things that you're worried about. Feel free to drop those things in the chat. But just as kind of a general piece, a lot of the things that we're hearing is that the young men or members have not been doing much in the virtual space over this summer. Either they have had haven't had summer classes, so they haven't really gotten familiar with the virtual space, or they're like, I don't know how to transition um, all of the things that we used to do to the virtual space. And so again, if you've got specific challenges, concerns, or worries that you have, we'd love to hear about them. Oh, Andy said, how to program and do rituals with cap of 20 people as a gathering? Absolutely. And just as an FYI up front, we are actually working right now to figure out how rituals can be done virtually. Um, and so that is something that we are absolutely already working on. And then for programming, we are going to encourage that all programming be moved virtual. Um, and a lot of our campuses are requiring that as well. And so want to make sure that we kind of own that up front. Um, Todd said, I'm concerned about monitoring in the virtual space. Todd, do you want to say more about what you mean by monitoring? Either you can unmute yourself or you can drop more comments in the chat, just so I make sure. Thanks, Christina. Yes, my concern is that people can talk and talk on the video space and talk about negative things that may be derisive or they think that they can get a, they can hide behind the computer screen and that's not good. Absolutely. So if your concern is that you're going to have a virtual program where people are going to say or do things that might be harmful or harmful or problematic, you can always disable um, the chat function to only go to like the panelists. So if we did that in this space, I would basically say anything that somebody says can only come to me and Anthony because Anthony and I are the host and co-host. So you can disable that to not go to everyone, to not create that space, Todd, for people to be able to do those things. And you can disable it to where they can't talk amongst each other as well, because sometimes that's what we worry about, where they'll get distracted in that space. So Todd, does that help answer your question? Yes. My further concern is that with these chat, with these chat options, will there always be somebody quote unquote responsible monitoring them? That's a great question. So I think it depends on who you're, who is presenting. So for me personally, I feel very comfortable presenting and checking the chat 
to make sure that I'm catching both things. However, if you've got somebody who is presenting, I think that's a question that we absolutely need to ask the presenter of what's your comfortability managing the content, the room, as well as the chat. So you can always designate someone to say, hey, you know, Todd, I need you to watch the chat function and let me know if there are questions along the way. Except sure. if you've got a chapter like with uh, Northwestern at Gamma, you could say, there's 115 guys in that chapter. So Harley's going to be the person presenting and his standards director, you know, so-and-so is going to be the person monitoring the chat to make sure that we're not losing any of the good questions or comments being made. Or that we're staying online. Yes, that we're staying on topic. Absolutely. Todd, thank you. And Andy, thank you for your comments as well. So one thing that we want to kind of own up front is that Transitioning to the virtual space, it kind of is what it is until it isn't, right? And so we are in this space until we are out of COVID-19, that we are past it, and probably even a little bit further than that. I would say that a lot of our campuses are probably going to take some pretty significant precautions, even post-COVID-19. I'm not sure what that world looks like, um, but I would say that we will continue to see some restrictions. And so I always, I literally have talked to multiple chapter presidents in the past couple of weeks where I'm like, look, we've got to get this under control, being in this virtual space, instead of living in this world and like, oh, well, maybe in a month, COVID-19 might be over. We'd rather us plan to be in the virtual space and be prepared than to keep hoping and wishing that we won't have to be in the virtual space at some point. So really understanding that this is where we are until we are no longer here. And then really our overarching goal for this upcoming term and really probably full academic year is to provide value especially when we are losing so many of the in-person things that we typically would do. And as we'll talk about tonight, a lot of the in-person stuff that we do, we can do virtually. It's just going to feel different. But the big reality is, right, we are losing our social events and gatherings. Whether they are party-like or just gathering-like, those things we are losing. And so how are we providing value and providing that social space um, in a different creative and unique way. And so I talked to a chapter president the other day that I said, look, you're gonna have to figure out how to not lose the guys in your chapter because they think you all are just gonna sit around and do nothing for this upcoming term. And so really being thoughtful about how can we do education and kind of get back to the true nature of what fraternity is about, you know, networking, growing, productive members of society, those kinds of things. So. When we think about the virtual space, really the things that are the same is that you're still gonna have to schedule a date and time. You're still gonna have to reach out to a presenter, have materials prepared, execute the event, and then have roles assigned if applicable. So to Todd's question, you know, you're still gonna have to have people who are doing things, whether that this is the person who's like working with the presenter and making sure they have everything they need in like the in-person space, or, you know, in the virtual space, making sure that somebody's watching the chat function or Q&A function. Now, the things, of course, that are different is we're not going to have the same physical space that we had. We now have our, our room, our breakout rooms, those kinds of things. But the truth is, is that the virtual space also sometimes becomes a lot more accessible. If a ZBT chapter wanted to hold a campus-wide event, it might become a lot more accessible to do it in the virtual space and say ZBT is hosting an event on, um, you know, fighting hate. They could or a lot healthier. Yes, yes. <laughs> but I think that's the reality, right, is that being able to do those things and make it more accessible to other people and create a space that is safe, you know, to Todd's point, for people to engage. And so also the nice part about the virtual space is you don't have to make a reservation anywhere. Uh, you, just, <laughs> you just have to have a Zoom account or a GoToMeeting account or whatever you're using. Um, there isn't any need to be pressured or feel stressed about getting a space on campus or in the community to hold an event. There's also a lot of times less side conversation. So for those of you who don't know me, I do a lot of presenting and facilitation and education on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And one of my favorite things about the virtual space 
is in fact the chat function. I don't have to tell people to quiet down or be quiet or stop interrupting. They can do that on their own time in the chat function because here's the truth. Those same people who are super chatty in person are gonna be the same people who are super chatty in the chat. It's just they're not distracting me anymore as the presenter. So being thoughtful about that too, but also creating this space where people are able to interact with each other is amazing to be able to do when so many of us have lost that ability to interact. And then there are opportunities for more engagement in the virtual space, which we will talk more about examples of that as we move along this evening. And in general, you don't need as many supplies as you probably typically would have needed before. And people can kind of, you know, come right from dinner or roll out of bed. They don't have to drive anywhere. They don't have to take a bus anywhere. They don't have to walk anywhere. And so thinking about how it does make it more accessible kind of overall. And so we want to talk you all through the nine steps for success in the virtual space. So the first thing is very similar to what it's always been, which is picking a topic. Um, but we do want to encourage our chapters to potentially survey their brothers or use the core and elective experiences that they are supposed to be developing through the journey process to determine what the topic should be. Right, so if it, through the core and elective experiences, 50% of the brotherhood has said, we want development in career um, engagement or advancement, then let's do a program on that and let's find somebody who can do that for us. One of the big things that we do wanna be able to communicate, which is super cool about the virtual space, is having our brothers consider ZBT from home as an option. Instead of having to go out and find a presenter Maybe we take one of the videos that have already been done and present it live for the chapter to be able to come to. Or maybe we just use one of the upcoming ZBT from home programs and all 20 brothers come or 40 brothers come to be able to be there and do that education together. Um, so really thinking about that first step and remembering that ZBT from home is and will continue to be a resource. And then picking a time and date. Again, not much different than what we used to do, but this is an opportunity to survey the brothers, figure out, you know, what is a good option for the guys, especially because some of them might still be home. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're working around their schedules, if they're still working or caring for family or friends. Um, and they can always use Doodle, the Doodle poll um, tool uh, to schedule a meeting or pick some times that work best for their guys. And then while picking a time and date, you, you also want to be contacting a presenter. We highly recommend that a presenter be a non-undergraduate brother, unless we have an undergraduate brother who has demonstrated some level of expertise in an area, right? Um, but we don't want to just say, well, I'm a criminal justice major, so I could present on the criminal justice system. No, if they've done some extensive research or have done some extensive work, absolutely. But we want to make sure that we're contacting a presenter. Also, the chapter can always contact headquarters. We have a lot of expertise on the headquarters staff that are more than willing to come in and do some education. Now, the reason why pick a date and time and pick a presenter are on the same line is because Sometimes you pick a presenter first and then you pick a date and time. And sometimes you pick a date and time first and then you or pick a presenter. Really, what is most important is that when you talk to the presenter, that you know what you want them to talk about. Like what's the topic that you want them to cover and what are maybe some learning outcomes and things that you want them, your brothers to achieve during that presentation. So I'm gonna pause for a second. Are there any questions that people have at this point? No, I'm just gonna make a quick statement that regarding the pick a time and date, be aware that themes or topics may evolve over time. Your presenter could say, yes, I would like to do that, but what if I do X, Y, and Z? So you have to be flexible and open to that. In regards to the like the topic changing over time, or like things happening in the world that change the topic, you mean, Todd? The the topic evolving over time. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I think we're seeing a lot of that right now. <laughs> so risk management might evolve over time as we kind of get farther into this term. 
um, issues around race or around identity might evolve over time, especially in the current state of our country, um, politics, the election. But I think it's just making sure, again, that we are picking presenters that have some level of expertise that can be flexible and adaptable should things change between when you first identify them and then when they present for the chapter. Does that help, Todd? Oh, I can't hear you, Todd. Oh, okay. You muted yourself. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. okay. <laughs> Perfect. So the next thing is moving into point three, which is communication to brothers of the details and expectations. So here's the deal. It is unfair to tell guys 24 hours in advance, oh, hey, we're going to have this program and we want everybody to show up. So making sure that we are giving our members enough time to make plans, whether that's I need somebody to watch this person or I need to take off of work, making sure that we're giving those details. But then to Todd's point earlier, let's also set some expectations of the virtual space. We expect that your video is on if you have video capabilities and you're able to turn your video on. We expect that it's on so we know people are engaged. We expect that if you're talking in the chat that it is on topic with what we're discussing. We expect that you're taking notes, whatever it may be, but that we're communicating those expectations up front. And then setting up the platform beforehand, making sure that if we're going to do polls in the Zoom space, that we have those polls set up beforehand so we're not losing time. A really good point that I want to make sure everybody knows is um, there is a function it, specifically in Zoom for breakouts. And there is the option to set up breakouts before um, you get into the Zoom space. However, in the event that a couple of people do not show up, it's going to mess up all of your preset groups. So I always recommend if you can make the time waiting to set up your breakout rooms until you're in the space and you can see everybody who is actually there and going to be there. So making sure that that is something that we think about. Another really good tip is sometimes there will be a lot of good stuff that is shared in the chat function that we're like, hey, I don't want to lose that. If you open the chat function and look where it says two and then it says everyone or whatever yours says, there will be three little dots to the side where you can click save chat. And that will give you an opportunity to save the chat. If there was something really cool that was said or a good conversation that was happening, any individual can go in and save the chat. So thinking about that as well. And then we also need to think about who is the point of contact for tech, right? If we come, so for instance, Anthony and I had a conversation earlier today. I'm like, Anthony, you've got us on tech, right? You're going to make sure that we're up and, we're up and running. So making sure that we have somebody who's going to be able to be that technical support in the virtual space should something go wrong. Making sure that we're able to have somebody who's doing the breakout rooms, launching the polls, those kinds of things. And then tracking attendance. This is the big one. People are like, Christina, how are we going to track attendance? Well, one, at the very bottom of the screen, particularly in Zoom, you will see participants. You can open that up and it will show you who is currently there. But typically on the back end, you can also see when people jumped in and when they jumped out. So making sure that there's a person, to Todd's point earlier, designated to paying attention to the participant group. And then if we think about that, we also need to discuss how are brothers going to get the information who missed? This is kind of the cool spot about being in the virtual space is that when we're in person, it's like, okay, Christina came and talked to us and now she's gone and it's over. But in the virtual space, we do have the opportunity to potentially record anything that we're doing. And so is it possible to record the event and give brothers 24 hours or 48 hours to watch if they had to miss? Because that's another way to keep them engaged in the event that they have a job or they have a really heavy class load or you all do programs every Tuesday night and they have a class from six to eight every Tuesday night, right? And so thinking about how can we potentially record in order to engage our brothers who maybe were unable to be with us. Another thing that we are going to heavily in, like suggest, I guess, recommend is that there be an assessment to the brothers. What was the program? How'd you feel? Like, 
Did you like the facilitator? Did you not like the facilitator? Was the topic good? Did you learn something? What did you learn? What were your key takeaways? And doing like a three to five question assessment to make sure that what we're offering the brothers is what they want and what they're asking us for. And then whoever is the leadership team, programming director, whomever underneath them, and then whoever is chosen to support that particular program should have conversations about what worked and what didn't. And then when we learn what worked and what didn't, making sure that we're not doing the things that didn't work again, and then what did work, how can we do those again and replicate them in different ways as well. So I'll pause again. Are there any questions here with questions three or points three through nine? Actually, I'm gonna make another point. Okay. The, the good thing is to ask is, and why? Why did it work? Why didn't it work? What do we replicate? And what do we leave out moving forward? Absolutely. I love that, Todd. So why didn't something work or why did it work? Um, just so everybody can get a good understanding of that as well. Thank you, Todd. That's great. Again, feel free to drop questions or comments in the chat as well. I'm totally happy to talk through those. So for those of you um, who aren't on staff um, that are on the call, one thing that you'll want to know is that we are updating the Standards of Excellence program this upcoming year. We're updating it based on feedback that we've gotten, based on COVID, um, but just based on like taking ZBT to the next level and making sure that every year it's a fresh program. And so we want to talk a little bit about some of the updates and as a uh, caveat to this, we will be doing a Standards of Excellence program next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Central Time. Um, so tell everybody, tell the undergrads, tell advisors, tell all your friends. We'd love folks to come and learn more about the SOE program. But these are the things that are in the SOE program. Um, this upcoming year, there will only be maybe a handful of things that we won't be requiring because of COVID, but almost everything can be done in the virtual space. So some examples are reviewing their risk reduction protocol and their crisis management plan. They can do that in the virtual space. They could do it as a workshop. They could send it out to everybody, ask them to give their thoughts, whatever it may be. We also wanna make sure that our chapters are reviewing their constitution and bylaws, which they can do in the same fashion. They can conduct the semi-annual brotherhood review vote. Um, and we want them to do that two times, right? One time in the fall, you know, kind of term and one in the spring term. Um, and for our quarter schools, they can kind of determine what works best, but at least two times. And so conducting that virtually is good. A lot of people will say, well, how do we vote? There are lots of voting options. They could do polls in Zoom, and there are lots of other mediums out there to be able to vote. We're happy to kind of help individual chapters understand what works best for them. And then as we already talked about rituals, we're working on how to get those virtual and more information to come on that from David and Anthony and the growth and recruitment team. Um, and then recruitment workshops. We are happy to come in and do those for the chapters, but those can all be done in the virtual space. For most of our chapters don't know that they're supposed to be doing pre-initiation meetings. It's in their gold book. If you haven't cracked a gold book, you should because you'll learn more. I've never seen it, but I know it's there according to the guys on staff. But the pre-initiation meeting can be done via Zoom, go to webinar, whatever it may be, whatever function will give you the opportunity to communicate kind of back and forth. I just, we utilize Zoom so much, it's always my go-to, but there's Teams and there's WebEx and there's all those options. And then the brotherhood orientation can be done virtually. Here's the caveat about the brotherhood orientation, right? It's supposed to be a four to six hour program. Nobody expects folks to sit on Zoom or WebEx for four to six hours. My recommendation would be to break it up over the course of a few days to give people some breathers. Or if you're like, heck yeah, we want to do it in one day, give yourself some breaks in between. Okay, we've gone 90 minutes. We're going to take 30 minutes off, whatever that may look like. Big Brother Mentoring Program can be done virtually once you assign them um, and you post them either via email or some type of uh, for, uh, format that you all use in the virtual space, then the Big Brother and Little Brother can connect. Now people are like, well, what about like our ritual or like the fun things that we do to celebrate the Big Brother? You, you still can, the Big Little Brother pair, you still can, again, it's just going to look different. 
And we don't want, what we don't want is to say, okay, well, we'll hold off on that until we can be back in person. Because then our new guys are missing out on that really cool experience. If you want to do some type of celebration once you get back and you're able to be in person, totally. But right now, let's focus on moving forward in order to not lose out on some of those really crucial experiences. Brotherhood building activities, of course, can be done in the virtual space. Brotherhood retreat is very similar to the brotherhood orientation. We recommend breaking it up over, you know, few hours of time, or again, if you want to do it in a full day, breaking it up, um, but also infusing in some fun stuff, whether that's we're all going to do a workout together, we're all going to have a meal together, we're going to play video games together, breaking the retreat up with other fun things to do. The milestone workshop can be done virtually, as well as educational programs, which we've already talked about. Senior and alumni panels. I love this one because we actually already had chapters doing this at the onset of COVID, having alumni come in and speak to the chapter. So this absolutely can be done. And then programs that are exploring ZBT's heritage. This is similar to an educational program, of course, in the nature of having a presenter and those kinds of things. I think what's kind of cool about the virtual space is you might actually have more access to presenters that just aren't on a specific campus might be able to call a campus nearby and connect. Or if, for instance, maybe we're talking to Gannon University, who doesn't have a lot of Jewish um, community in the town that they're in, and there isn't like um, a lot of partnership opportunities in the Jewish space, maybe now they can call a nearby campus that maybe has a Hillel or Chabad or you know, a Jewish community that could help support them in the virtual space. So again, if, any, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute. I'm happy to answer any questions about any of these if there are some. All right, we will keep moving. And so these are the accreditation points to be clear. These are like the big ones, the things that they care about. They're like, oh, we've got to get these done because you have to do so many out of so many. Anthony, remind me what it is. It is 23 out of 30. Perfect. Thank you so much. 23 out of 30, they have to get done. And the stir points are the extra things. So one of these might be a workshop on appropriate behavior during social events. Um, for those of you who are aware, you know, the, our nation has been rocked in the fraternal movement by the abolished Greek life movement. Um, and we have been seeing a lot of concerns around racism, homophobia, financial burdens, um, sexual violence. And so we have added into the standards of excellence this year, uh, doing some education on what is expected behavior during social events. A lot of times I think we think our dudes just come with this knowledge and come with this information because they were raised right or whatever. But the reality is, is that some people have never had opportunities to have real conversations around these topics. They haven't had people demonstrating that for them. And so making sure that they have that as well. Um, so that's one that we've added. There's hazing prevention education, sexual misconduct, and bystander intervention that they could do committee meetings. So all of our individual director positions should have committees and those committee meetings can be done virtually. Officer transitions, which Cody Taylor, who's on the call, the assistant director of chapter services has come back to staff, which is super exciting. And we will be creating an officer transitions program, which can be done virtually, but similar to the other ones, it's probably gonna be a longer program. And so if they wanna break it up over time, that would probably be most ideal. Reviewing the ritual and doing the ritual, we've already talked about alumni engagement. They can still do newsletters. They can still host events virtually. Most of our campuses are moving to virtual recruitment or some form of. A lot of our campuses right now are still trying to figure out how can we do this in person? And a lot of days I'm like, okay, well, I guess we'll just wait and see when they move virtual. But we do have some campuses that are like staggering their events to be able to do them in person and have fewer people, but just know that that's also something that can be done virtually. Celebrating Founders Day or Roger Williams Day, creating relationships with Hillel, Habad, the community Jewish uh, partners, celebrating Jewish holidays or education on Jewish holidays, doing Israel Advocacy Day, and then a lot of times people are like, wait, how are we going to do philanthropy events 
um, or service events virtually. There will be opportunities, and we already have some chapters who have been raising money for CNMH or for um, activist-related communities or organizations they're raising money for. So if that's something you're interested in, we are happy to talk you through all of the specifics of what that would look like. And then as a reminder, ZBT programs, our words to action, our safe smart dating, our alcohol skills training program, and we'll also have some additional new um, education coming on to the virtual space. We'll have some other sexual violence education, hazing education that we'll be doing um, that can be done in the virtual space as well. And so these are kind of the big ones about SOE. These will still be expectations as we are pushing people at our chapters to do um, and to continue to provide value in the virtual space. I'll throw up some of the virtual events. We did a, a Brotherhood Development Director Roundtable and talked to them about the virtual events. And these are just some fun or, you know, check-in type virtual events. Uh, I had a executive officer from one of our schools, I think it was FDU Madison, say, just focus on having fun. Focus on connecting, focus on the brotherhood. Don't make it harder than it needs to be. Um, do the things that you've always done just in the virtual space. So this is a list of some of those things. I think, you know, we've already talked about meals together, but we are seeing like esports competitions, watching stuff together, cahoots, trivia. Um, you know, if there's like a new skill that you want to learn, if somebody wants to do a video teaching people guitar or learning to cook something specific or whatever that may be. These are just some of the events that we have talked with the undergrads about. Um, we've also encouraged outdoor games that you can be physically distanced in. So we had a chapter call us and say, oh, we're gonna play basketball. And I'm like, wait, pause, no. <laughs> you're missing the point. That can't be physically distanced. There's going to be a whole lot of touching. And so instead trying to do some outdoor games that can be more physically distant. So um, if there are questions, again, please, please, please let me know. I'm happy to answer those. And then let's talk a little bit about how to make the space more engaging and meaningful. One of the things I think can be super helpful is like the week in advance of a program to ask the members what they want to get from the program or what they, what questions they have or concerns they have. So to take those questions beforehand, especially in an educational programming format and give those questions to the presenter because then the presenter can speak to those things and make sure that the questions that the brothers have are getting answered. I also typically use the self-reflection tool when I'm presenting. So I will pose a question and give the participants like 60 seconds to jot down a thought, you know, write it or write it on their computer or on their phone, um, just to give them some time to self-reflect. Whereas maybe if we would have been in person, I would have just asked them to write something down or turn to the person next to them. Um, but also polls. So polls can be launched um, and can be shared, you can get all of the results and share all of the results with the participants. And so I'm going to give you an example of what this looks like. So if I launch this poll, you should be able to see it up on your screen. And it asks, what areas of virtual programming engagement tools do you have experience with? So I'd love for all of you to answer and I will give you a second or two to tell me what you have experience with. Give you like 15 more seconds. You look at your screen, you should be able to see it pop up. I will be honest though, sometimes we have issues in the virtual space and people can't see it. So I will end the poll now and I will share the results. So give me a thumbs up if you can see the results on your screen. Perfect. So you will see, um, you know, a couple, one of us has done polls before, but now everybody has done polls. Uh, breakout rooms, a few of you have used the chat function, question and answer, self-reflection. One of the things that's really important to note is the Q&A function typically is only enabled if you're doing a webinar. Um, the chat function is usually always available and polls tend to always be available too. In the event that the chapter is wanting to do something via 
uh, or excuse me, if they're wanting to do breakouts, they cannot be in the webinar format to do breakouts. So they have to be in Zoom meeting versus Zoom webinar. Those kinds of things can kind of get tricky in the virtual space. So then I just stop sharing the results with you all and then it goes off of your screen. But those are the big ones. So I think one of the things about breakouts that's really great is you can kick people around in different spaces. So you can put them in one room and then move them to another room. You can project comments. Um, or statements into the room like, hey, you know, you all have two minutes left to finish, finish up talking. Um, so the breakout function is really helpful. Keynote though, if you are not the host, you cannot manage breakouts. So that is something that kind of gets confusing. If you are the co-host, breakouts go away. You have no control over them. So making sure that that's something that, you know, the folks are aware of. And then um, those are the big ones. Do you all have any examples of how to make virtual programming more engaging and meaningful? I would love to hear those. And if you don't, that's okay. I will also offer that sometimes I like to just do fun stuff. So when I'm presenting, I typically tell people that I'm a Grey's Anatomy enthusiast. Then I ask people to drop in the chat their favorite character or favorite season. And so I do think that it's also fun to just kind of connect with people in that way in the virtual space too, um, to break up kind of the just staring at each other thing that we do um, in the virtual space. So I, that is all the content that I created. I'd love to hear what questions that you all have. Is there anything specific that we can help you work through? in regards to virtual programming or questions that you had that you did not get answered. I'll give you a second. Feel free to drop it in the chat or unmute yourself. Christina, do you know how many hosts, uh, is there a limitation to the number of hosts that you can have in a virtual event? It's a good question. So you actually have to have a different type of subscription to have more hosts. Um, and I have only heard of up to two, but I am sure there's some really expensive subscription out there that could give you more, but it does cost more to get more hosts. Now, you can have a host and multiple co-hosts, um, but again, the co-hosts don't have the same uh, abilities, for sure. Great question, though, Jonathan. Other questions, Todd, Andy, Ricky, anything else you all have questions about? I mean, this is great for us to give um, a overview to the to the guys, but I mean, they've got to run it. I'm not I'm not going to be on there running it for them. So I mean, I assume, you know, I mean, I you know, I've not I've just attended a lot of Zoom meetings, so I've not run them. So you know, a lot of the the features you're talking about, I've seen, I've never run. I assume that our guys have, but I you know, again, I'm just assuming that. So I don't know what kind of technical knowledge they have about the technology there. So, I mean, what type of support is National going to provide on training for them? Yeah. Um, not just ideas, but also how to use the technology. They can call us at any time. Andy, I have become a bit of a Zoom whiz, particularly, I know Anthony, who had to drop off the call because he had another meeting. Taylor Moreau, our office manager, is very well versed in a multiple different platforms. Um, so we are more than happy to get on the phone. But they, but they have to reach out to you. There's not going to be some, some type of training that you're going to proactively so it is likely that we will talk them through it in like our monthly calls that we do with chapters. So um, Andy, we kind of set what we're going to discuss in our monthly meetings. And that's absolutely something that I can make sure that we ask of like, how familiar are you with this and what training do you need? I, I think the reality is, is we can do some short videos if those kinds of things would be helpful and those short videos are also already out there. But Taylor, when I had a question about breakouts and she's like, watch this three minute video. And it was just like a quick video on YouTube. But I think it is something that we can ask chapters more specifically to say, hey, you know, brothers at University of Mizzou, what do you know and how can we help for sure? Yeah. And then when is the, the new stuff with the standards of excellence going to be communicated to them so they can plan? I mean, it seems a lot more, um, planning is going to have to go in to hit a lot of those things in a virtual space than 
than in a non-virtual space. So I think that's kind of what we're trying to communicate is that really the planning won't look much different. Now they are probably going to have to do much more of that planning over email, right? So they're going to have to keep up on their email in a different way than they probably had to before. They won't be able to just stop in somebody's office. Um, but that, that piece in particular uh, for SOE, your question, we will do the program next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Central. We will roll out the information after that. And then during those monthly calls that we have, that will be a check-in point that we have with all the chapters of like, hey, let's go through SOE and discuss the changes. Is that going to be a mandatory thing? I mean, uh, you know, I know, I mean, I know I got that email on it, but I, I got the email on this. I thought this was not just advisors. I thought there would be undergrads on this too, but maybe I was wrong. Yeah, no, well, it was, it was sent to undergraduates. Um, but the thing is, is that the monthly meetings that they have are mandatory. They, they have to meet with their staff liaison um, once a month. And so that will be where we can kind of talk more intentionally about their specific chapter and standards of excellence. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the questions. Those were super helpful. Other things, other questions. Oh, hold on. Ricky says a lot of institutions also provide Zoom support in the form of videos, et cetera, through their IT or the Office of Instruction. I think, Ricky, you make a good point. A lot of our um, undergraduates are getting access to whatever their um, campus is using, whatever platform their campus is using, and then they have the IT support. So for example, like George Washington University is solely using WebEx. And so that's a community that we might have to talk more specifically with because they're not using Zoom, but they're using a different platform than kind of the traditional platform or I guess more widely used platform. So absolutely. Thank you, Ricky, for that comment. Any other questions or concerns? I guess the only other one that I would say is uh, the importance of the mute feature. Um, when, when you're hosting a group of any type of size, uh, one thing that we've learned uh, at the foundation with our events is, is making sure you mute people as they join the meeting, uh, especially if your intention is to record it and, and put it up uh, for everybody to consume. Yeah, so a couple of things on that. There is a feature when you're setting the meeting up to mute everybody as they enter. So you don't have to go through and click everybody. It'll already do that. If you forget, the host and co-host can automatically mute people, or you can also just make it to where nobody can ever come off of mute, particularly when you're in webinar format. So absolutely, Jonathan, that's super helpful. Thank you. Other things, other thoughts, other questions? Okay. Well, if there's anything that you all need, please, please, please reach out to us um, on staff. We are happy to take your questions and we appreciate you all being here tonight. So thank you so much and have a great evening. Bye-bye. I'm being surrounded by children. I know, I see that. I think it's great. I'm gonna stop recording. Um, how are you? Good. How